You're listening to the Grow Landscapers podcast. The podcast where we delve deeper into landscape business, interviewing legends of the UK landscaping industry. So, join host Nick Ruddle as he explores their thoughts, insights and experiences. That's here on the Grow Landscapers podcast. Welcome to the Grow Landscapers podcast. I'm Nick Ruddle, and today's episode is going to be slightly different to the normal ones. Usually it's me interviewing other people. Today it's me being interviewed by Jim Wilkinson from uh, Pro Landscaper magazine and also Futurescape. So uh, uh, we discuss, it's, it's basically a whole bunch of edited down snippets from the conversation that I had with him. Um, and it's a whole bunch of snippets discussing what it takes to run a successful business in the landscape industry. It's all the key things that I coach my clients in um, to give them great results. And um, I think you'll find it really useful. So um, I think it's only about 20 minutes long. So um, get your pen and paper ready if it's safe to do so and um, and make and make a lot of notes if there's you know something that you need help with and you feel that you um you resonate with a lot of the challenges that we discuss in this interview then you know feel free to to get in touch with me directly uh, nick at nickruddle.com anyway enough of that um enjoy the rest of the podcast speak to you soon I know you work with quite a lot of landscape companies and, and again, systems is quite important for you, I guess. Yeah, I think, um, you know, the same, uh, all the same stuff that, that applies to the large corporates, it applies exactly the same to small companies. You know, they all need the right systems and processes in place, but unfortunately most of them don't. So um, I've been coaching since 2007, um, over 5,000 hours of one-to-one coaching, lots of webinars and seminars and workshops. And um about 60% of our clients at the moment are in the landscape industry, as you know, and some of them, our longest serving client, has just gone into their ninth year. Um, and over that time, you know, the, the challenges are all the same. Um, I think they're great at what they do, is, uh, landscape related people, landscapers or, or designers, very good at what they do, but not always as good at running the business as they do on the operational stuff. So it's great to be able to educate them so that their knowledge on the, um, the operational stuff is still great but it's just bringing that up to the same level. So they become professional business people as well. Um, and I think there's so much passion uh, in, in the landscape industry. All the clients we have are so passionate about what they do. They care so much about doing a great job. Um, and I think they get frustrated by not having the, the um, results that, that they should be getting. Um, so I think when you, when you work with them and you get the results and they're delivering a great end product, you know, it's, um, it's a wonderful, very rewarding uh, career to have. I just just pick up a bit on that Nick, where you say you coach them to do it because it it's 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 where is that line and where does a business coach integrate into running the business and actually coaching the people to run the business? How, how, how do you differentiate between the two? Well, I think the difference between um, well the, the the main benefits of coaching I I see are two things: education and accountability. So first of all, we've got to educate people to do things better because if they become better. They do better, therefore they have better results. Um, so, you know, you've got to have the two working in tandem because what we know we need to do and what we actually sometimes do are two different things. So having a coach there gives you that accountability to make sure you do the things that you know you should be doing, but if it's left to yourself, you possibly might not do it, you know. So I think it comes down to education because if you keep doing what you've always done, you'll get the same results you've always had. Do you, do you look at companies and know you can help and not help. Do you, do you get the feeling that the type of company that's typical for, for you to add value to quite quickly? Or I think, you know, the, the longer you've done it, the easier it is to spot instantly. You know, um, most of them probably struggling with the wrong kind of people. A lot of the challenges they face is not having the right people, but then not knowing how to recruit the right people, not how, knowing, knowing what the key things are that you need to have in place in order to attract the best kind of people, the right kind of people for you. So having your company's core values, which is basically your identity and your the rules of working for you. If you want to work here, these are the kind of people we have. Once you've got the right people on the bus, then, you know, a lot of the other things fall into place, but a lot of people are not experts at recruitment or management or leadership. So you have to develop those kind of skills. Um, but obviously you need to have great systems and processes in place because otherwise you've got all these people coming in, even if they're great people, but if there's no structure or no systems or no sort of proven methodology of how to do things, then everyone's going to be doing it in their own way and getting inconsistent results. So I think 
if you if you if you can identify that they don't have the right people or there's no systems, then obviously straight away you know that there's 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 areas to, to focus on. I heard there, Nick, too, about judging the business by what's in their bank account. Yeah, I, I guess it's something you look at as well and, and agree. I think the very first couple of areas we look at really is the mastery level, so the foundations of the business. And one of those areas is money mastery. One of those is time mastery, because a lot of the people are quite time poor to begin with. So mm -hmm. you can have all the ideas and strategies in the world, but if they don't have the time to implement, it's never going to happen. But I think, you know, it, hand in hand with that, having great understanding and expertise and knowledge around your numbers is crucial because if you're not really making a lot of profit or if you're actually making a loss if you think right we need to go and get more business you just end up going bust quicker so you know understanding your margins your pricing and having a, a you haven't got to be an expert you haven't got to be a, an accountant you just got to know what the numbers mean and how to interpret them. Um, and a lot of um, business owners, not just in the landscaping industry, but in all industries, they don't necessarily know the numbers and it, it scares them. So they avoid them, you know, and, um, and, and it actually, once you understand it, it's like once you learn anything that you don't know, when you know it, it's easy. But when you don't know it, it's all confusing and scary. So I think, um, you know, what Alison said there is actually spot on. I think you've got to get the numbers right early on because um, otherwise you, you're working like a busy fool, potentially. The thing is, before I, when I sit down with someone for, for the first time, I'll, I'll, I'll be looking for three things. Um, and um, Alison's mentioned one of them there, about commitment. So it's passion, commitment, and vision. So I'll write these, those, those three words down, and um, I won't necessarily ask them or tell them that, but I'll be looking out for that. And, and at the end, I'll say, you know, I look for three traits in people, because... You know, it's a simple process, but it's not necessarily easy. So um, when, when the going gets tough, you know, if they're not put, prepared to put the work in, if they're not committed, if they're not really that bothered, not that passionate, then they're not going to do the work. Therefore, they're not going to get great, great results. You know, it's like going to a personal trainer and then sitting in the pub three months later drinking your beer and, and then and saying, oh, I had a personal trainer once, it was useless. But, you know, if you, you've got to do the work. So you don't necessarily want to take those clients on because, you, you know, it's not going to give for your reputation and it's a waste of their money and your time. So I think, you know, if you can see that in them and you can see that they're, they're really keen, but they just don't necessarily have the right skills and the tools to do the right job, the business tools to do the job, then they're never necessarily going to, going to be good, good clients and they're not going to stay for a long time. You know, our longest client in the industry, who you know who that is, Jim, um, been working with them for two, uh, nine years now, just gone into into their 10th year um, and people won't stay if they're not committed and if they're not passionate and, and but but you will stay if you keep getting results and you resonate with your coach you know I mean the coach is really important you've got to like each other if you think about it you, you, any relationship you've got to like that person for it to continue if you don't if you don't quite feel that that chemistry then you're probably not going to enjoy the coaching because you don't enjoy you don't sort of gel as as two individuals moving on slightly Nick. and in terms of is a real value to a business owner when they are trying to scale or grow rather than maybe they just want to do their business slightly better you know it, it, does there have to be some kind of ambition um, to make a, a coach advisor a mentor however <laughs> however we're going to recall it um work yeah well i think i think you need to have a vision as an individual as a business owner to be able to engage and enroll and inspire your people to be wanting to be buying into that 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 final destination if you don't know where you're going then how can you sort of rally the troops and get everyone in the same direction so you need to have i think a bit more ambition than just trying to fix the problems i think you know um that will hold people back and it's not going to inspire others around them because then it's just going to be a job going in every every day day to day to just do a job and that's not sustainable i don't think for for, for anyone really i think people need to be inspired they need to buy into your vision what you're trying to achieve to make you look better um, than, than the other, your competitors, you know, working for someone else so that they feel they're actually part of something a bit special. If it's just going and doing the day-to-day, -day, that's not very inspiring and people will come, they'll go, they'll come, they'll go. And, um, and I don't think you'll ever achieve what you really want to achieve. You've got to have, you know, an end game. What does the business look like when it's finished? You know, and then, then you look back and, and, and then you work back three years one year and then bring it back to a 90 day plan that you engage all your team with and allocate tasks for them to do so that everyone's accountable to achieve, you know, the long-term vision of the company. You, you, you've, you've got the client, you're engaged and what, what, what's the most obvious hurdles that you have to overcome to start with? Nick? What's the, the ones that come up more often? Is, is it still the individual? Or with, with the business owners or with the... Yeah, with the business oh. owners. So they, they've, they've come on gauge, they open up to you. What's, what's the things that, 
you know, the, the most why it wouldn't work more if it didn't happen. Um, well, I think by the time someone has reached out to you to, to want your help, they're, they're, they've accepted that they can't do it themselves. And, and I think, I don't know if there's any major barriers. I think what I find is that people, once they've made that decision, they've, they're open to your advice, your expertise and your knowledge. So you know, otherwise, why would they bother? So I think it's not necessarily always the, uh, the, the resistance you get from the business owner. I think they're already bought in and they, they can see the benefit of what you're going to do and, and how to do things, how you go about, you know, um, that process, starting that process. Sometimes you get a, a bit of resistance from individuals within the business because some people don't like change and, and sometimes they're the problem, you know? So if some, I, th I think statistically what I heard years ago around the action coach network, and we're in I know, 80 or 90 countries these days, is that when we start coaching people, 30% of their staff on average will leave. Mm. But that means that generally it's the 30% that are causing most of the problems. Mm. Um, and the people that do buy into it, that, that like the vision, that like having values, like having structure, like following systems, all those kind of things, they're the ones you want to keep. And then the new ones that you recruit in the right way um, are only ever going to know that way that they come into. So over time, you can help to sort of change the culture. So I think the only resistance is from the people that are causing you a lot of the problems. Um, yeah. Otherwise, why why would they be resistant to wanting to build the business? You know. So I think a lot of the headaches. I think it's normally like the eighty twenty rule. So twenty percent of your people will cause you eighty percent of your problems. So if you get rid of those, then obviously you're going to start getting less challenges, putting out less fires, and having a much a less stressful life. In terms of the coach's role then, is it more in trying to position the business as somewhere to go and work for or how, how involved would you get into that recruiting and recruiting the right people? Well, we've got a, an amazing um, proven recruitment process. Um, being an a action coach, being a franchise, everything is systemised, as you can imagine. And the recruitment process that we have, the clients, the feedback is phenomenal. Um, and once you take them through the right hoops and get the right people, you're, you're testing for attitude throughout, not necessarily even about their, their skill set initially. It's about getting the right mindset. So the, the official process for our recruitment process is not actually sending a CV in. Now it is with, with Indeed because you can only apply by sending your CV in. But um, we get people to, to phone a number and answer three very simple questions. Um, if they fail to answer those questions or phone that number then they've deselected themselves so it's a whole it's not a selection process it's a deselection process it's like x factor you know you start with a massive amount of people and you go down to that and that and that but people have to do something because it shows that they care and they're really serious about working for you and and that job has my name written all over it kind of thing so um i think having the right recruitment process is, is you know is absolutely crucial um but you know, with the, the, the skills come second in a, in a way because if they haven't got the right attitude, but they've got the skills, that's that's never going to work because they'll never get to work with other people and maybe start annoying the good ones. And if you those good ones are looking to lead it for leadership to, from you, and if you're not doing anything about it or you're too scared or you don't know or like like Alison said, you know, scared about employment law issues, then then you'll end up losing your best people. Um, because you know, they, they just can't stand the thought of working another day with that individual. Even though on paper they might be brilliant, mm -hmm. it's never going to be a good person fit for the for the company. With, with, I'm desperate to get as many questions in as I possibly can, but in and jump around a little bit. But with with with, with a skilled, hands-on person that starts developing the company and, and does well because mm -hmm. of what they do, how how difficult is it to teach them? about how to run the business rather than just purely focus on the bit that they love and they enjoy and, and what got them to that level that they've already got to. I've got to come next, sorry. Um, so I think you've got to, they've got to um, look at their why and um, what's the bigger picture? Why are they doing this? Why, why are they actually in business in the first place? What, what do they want their life to look like? And I think if, if they don't know what that is, then they're never going to be able to you know, achieve what they need to achieve in the business. Um, so a lot of people actually don't really necessarily know have any any life goals. You know they don't they don't think like what does my life look like in five years, ten years time. You know they, it, it should be life by design rather than life by accident. So I think in order to you know to, to achieve what they need to do, what they need to achieve, um, the, the 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 goal should be driven from a personal point of view first, and then think right, okay, what does the business need to achieve and deliver in order to make that my reality and my family's reality? You know, and, and I think you know once they've got clarity on 
their why and what they want to leave in terms of legacy for their family or what they want to you know they're, they're to, to give their families then i think you can um, get momentum and push the business forward and and get you know excited about that how do you see your roles in helping a company because at the moment especially in the landscaping sector there seems to be a lot of work and you know one of the questions is well if we scaled up could we win more how where would you see your role in in helping that happen or questioning whether that would happen or it's the right time to do it nick um i think it comes down to a number of things really i mean it's like building a skyscraper unless you've got the right foundations first if you built it on sandy ground every time you try and scale up and develop it and put another another floor on it comes crashing down so you've got to have real solid foundations and i think um you've got to have the right systems in place the right um processes procedures being followed um if you don't have those in place then you're never going to be able to scale up because there'll be too many mistakes and the more busy the busier you get the more of a nightmare you'll create so um i think having the right organizational chart the right framework the right people in the right positions with the right skills in their flow like um, Alison says um and making sure that everyone has very clear uh, roles and responsibilities so that they know exactly what their part is to play in building that assuming they're the right people um but then it is once you've got the documented procedures in terms of this is how we do things here and you've got everything all nicely organized like systemology the other side of my business which is about putting all this stuff in place it's it, it then you'll get to the point where it is scalable and then the final part is then it's saleable because if if, if it's if it's not fully systemized not fully documented it will work and it's better than having it just in everyone's heads but once it's all down in a nice logical organized manner with this is how you do things step by step by step that truly will be scalable and then saleable at that point and i wonder the construction and landscape industry ha is that reflected in in other sectors that you've been involved in nick and or is it you know is there more of an emphasis here that we're, we're much more focused on the core skill rather than the business acumen i think it's it doesn't matter which sector you're in um, the same challenges are in the same in every single kind of industry and sector that, that you can think of really uh, the generalized principles are all the same and i think the the challenges are the same obviously applied differently and they've got different situations but but whether you're a landscaper whether you're a, know, a solicitor or whether you're a shopkeeper i think people don't necessarily always know that have have the, the knowledge in the numbers and, and the business acumen the business education and i think those clients that have chosen and do choose to educate themselves off their own back to read books or listen to audio books those ones um obviously are much more successful um but it comes back to education really and i think exactly as alison said um you've got to know your numbers and you've got to become as good as you are operationally with the business as well so you've got the, the the operational knowledge of being very good at what you do but often the business knowledge is down here so our job is to bring the both up and at that point you know you have a great business but you've got to be prepared to, to want to learn and and listen and, and take advice um otherwise what's the point you know you're not going to you're not going to get where you want to get to you know you'll stay where you are I think so with the customer journey which is what we call the critical client flow and it's identifying the 20 percent of systems and tasks that deliver 80 percent of your results so it's, and it's exactly about you know how you generate the lead how you deal with that inquiry how you then take them through your sales process how you get them on boarded how you invoice them and then how you deliver because that's pretty much most of what you do and everyone should be focused around all those key activities there's loads of other systems and processes around the business hr and management systems and stuff but you know it's those crucial um tasks and processes of exactly what you do and how you do it as a business and i think once you've got that that framework in place then everything else um becomes a lot easier I am conscious of time. There's a couple of things I desperately want to talk about, and uh, and, and one of them, and I, is just on that. There, so you know, this industry, especially again, the landscaping industry, is quite creative, and it's creative people and systems don't always match together. And I, I just wondered how that works. Um, and then I, I, I'd like to understand a bit, like it's quite an owner-operating business here, and people get to a certain age, and then they think, oh, it's time to sell, how to sell. Where where does your roles come in that? And, and how do you do very quickly on that creative and systems how do, how do they merge together and then where, where do you sit in terms of helping shape a business to be sold or passed on Nick we'll start with you on that I think um, people get scared of systems and they think you're going to become robots in the business but what it actually does it, it, it frees you up to be more efficient with your time so that you can 
focus on being more creative as opposed to making mistakes and trying to fix those mistakes. So it's a bit of a myth, really, that the systems um, sort of nullifies or impacts on, on creativity. Actually, when you put it into practice, it gives people more time to be creative as opposed to the opposite. Because just because it's systemized doesn't mean that you lose all your creativity. It's a framework to make sure you're doing things in the right way. But as a result of doing that, you'll get more time to be creative. And that, and that sort of as people are getting older in terms of advising and helping them in a situation to make a decision whether to sell their business or to pass it on, what, what, what's the role that you play there? Um, I think once you've got everything systemized and, and you know that this is how we do things here in all different departments, with all different processes, um, then it becomes less owner dependent. And the trouble is if, if the business owner is still part of that equation, take the business owner out of that, how much is your business worth? It's not really going to be worth as much, but if it's fully systemized to the point where if you wanted to sell it, and, and a lot of people say, oh, I never want to sell my business, but if something goes wrong or you get health problems or your circumstances change, it's nice to have the choice whether you choose to step away. And But at that point, you might not want to sell the business because it's working nice and profitably without you like a well-oiled machine. So you might actually, I, I can go and do other things, but still keep a nice little passive income and, and check the KPIs every week or every month and make sure that everything's where it should be. Um, but unless it's systemized, and if you're still part of that equation, you're never really going to be able to step out. And and, and if, if you do want to step out, then the price that you'll be able to command will be obviously a lot lower. But they reckon that if, if a business is fully systemized to the way that it should be, it's between two to five times more if you do want to sell it. But if you're part of that equation, it's going to affect the, um, you know, the, the, um, the price you'll be able to get for it. As with you, Nick, just, just with the, the finishing line to sum it up for all business coach, mentors, advisors, why, why should a business owner have one? Well, I think if you're stuck with where you are and you want to be here, but you're stuck here, what's, the, 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 what's going to bridge the gap to get you from here to there? And I think that's, that's the point where, where most people um, struggle. They just don't know what that next step is they need to take in order to achieve that. But um, what I was going to say is in the wise words of Jim Rohn, who is a, a very famous American business philosopher, always said, work harder on yourself than you do on your job. Because when you get better, life gets easier. So I think, you know, if you keep doing what you've always done, you get what you've always got and all those wonderful cliches. But, you know, it's true. In order to, to have better, you've got to become better. Thanks for listening to the Grow Landscapers podcast. To get in touch and see how we can help you with your business by emailing nick at nickruddle.com.